you have a Bible, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 2? We'll pick up where we left off last week. We're getting to verse 12. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country. Those being the three or multiple magi by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through his prophet, Out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time they had learned from the Magi. That was, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comfort because there they are no more. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you are in light of who we are. We thank you for your love when we can be cruel. We thank you for your constants and stability when we often are transient and temporary. We thank you for your forgiveness when we do the despicable. We thank you for the fact that you provide joy and hope when often there is weeping and mourning. Father, we thank you for the reality of what it means that you came among us, that your son would be called Emmanuel, God, with us. We thank you for the reality that he was tempted in the same way we were, that he bore our afflictions, that he understands the suffering and the struggles of this world, and he provides the hope that there is a new day coming. And we thank you for these things. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. It is the most happiest, glorious, joyous time of the year. <coughs> Except when it's not. <laughs> It's the time where everything happens positively. When Carol Brady wakes up with laryngitis before the big Christmas presentation, it will take a Christmas miracle that only the Lord and Santa can deliver for her to sing that song and ruin my father's Christmas in that very special episode of Brady Bunch. <laughs> As Fonzie sits in his garage, eating from his lonely can of beans, luckily Richie Cunningham will find him and invite him to the Cunninghams so he doesn't celebrate Christmas alone. Luckily for the family waiting to hear back from their son in Korea, Hawkeye and BJ will change the time on the clock so they'll never know that their son died on Christmas. They'll think he died on the 26th, like that somehow will make a difference. And that doesn't even get me into all the creepy stuff we do in animation this time of year. Come on, think about this for a second. This is the happiest time of the year. I get a mentally challenged snowman who says happy birthday every time you put a hat on him as my choice or I have some sadistic little elf who wants to pull teeth for the rest of his life hanging out with some sort of reindeer with misfit toys and I know what you're thinking oh good he's going to get into the bah humbug portion of the sermon 
or for those of you who prefer the American Christmas Carol, I assume it was Va Humbug A, since that was also played by Henry Winkler in the Bond. But in the four stories we've told in these nights, this is the one where you wish it truly had been a silent night. We're grateful for the fact that in the evening, Gabriel comes to Mary to tell her the truth of the child born to her and of the dream that he interrupts to let Joseph know to keep the child. We're excited at the hope for the outcast of the shepherds that the angels appear and sing the message of great joy, not only for them, but for all the world. We rejoice with the reality that even the pagan can find and come to the reality of what God is doing, as we saw in the evening when the caravan comes from the east and arrives in Bethlehem. And if that's to celebrate, then celebrate and enjoy Christmas. But I fear that for some, those aren't the stories that they think of. Those aren't the stories that resonate with Christmas. For them, they kind of find themselves with these mothers who find themselves with their night interrupted. Where Christmas is not a time of silence, but it's a time where they wish that there was silence where they can return to a time of status quo, of the good old days of what Christmas once was, but something has changed that dynamic forever. I'm curious, when I read this story, to think of those who heard it. I'm curious if there are disciples in the middle of the first century who are either the children born to the next child to some of these mothers, or the grandchildren who hear the story of what happened that night when Herod sent his men to find baby Jesus. And I wonder if they don't start to think of themselves, I remember this being not exactly the story we told of a glorious moment in the history of our family. This is that moment where we talk of it like it was receiving that letter and that visit from the military informing you of bad news. This is the reminder of the tragedy that struck our family. And I wonder if there are some of us who when Christmas comes, there's not a bigger issue of tragedy or change that comes into place. Where there's just something about Christmas that yes, it should be the most glorious time of the year. But in fact, you feel guilty that for you it's not. And I want to tell you that this story is for you, if that's the way you feel. And I wonder if it doesn't challenge us a little bit in our middle celebration to not remember that this, for some, is not the most glorious time of the year. Sometimes Christmas is not easy to celebrate. Sometimes it would be nice just to get back to the, to the idea of there being silence in the middle of the night. Maybe it would be nice if Christmas were a silent, peaceful, calm time. Sometimes it's not. And it's not for anyone in this story. Think about it. For the three kings and for Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, this is not exactly the most confident and kind of comfortable evening on the planet. It's not easy to be told, get out and move and go now. And for some of us, life occasionally leads to that. Where Christmas is different this year. Where Christmas has been different for many years in the face of the change that we have had to deal with. Maybe it's a loss of a job. Maybe it's a change of location. Maybe it's a family member who, instead of you leaving, has gone somewhere else. And they will not be here this Christmas. Maybe there's that ability not to bring back that Norman Rockwell picture of Christmas for you. And instead of that leaving to December 25th and being a day of joy, it's a day of weeping. It's a day of feeling something just isn't there. Maybe for you, the story isn't the story that you see on TV that will run endlessly on loops for the next week. Of all those wonderful Christmas miracles, and you go, that's not going to happen this year. Maybe for you, it's the comfort and the understanding that you're not alone to feel that way. As he begins his final letter ever written, 
Paul wishing to have the kind of moment of peace and calm and the good old feeling writes this when he says this to Timothy. Recalling your tears, I long to see you. Why? So that I may be filled with joy. There's something about separation that can cause anxiety this time of year. There's something about missing loved ones or missing the familiar or trying to figure out how to adjust that leads to Christmas not necessarily being the most glorious time of the year. Think about it. We even tried to turn that into something nostalgic. I mean, after he got done dreaming of a white Christmas, which I can only assume means he wasn't planning to drive anywhere. Remember, Bing Crosby then saying this, remember these words? Christmas Eve will find me where the love light gleams. I'll be home for Christmas. Where? If only in my dreams. The problem is when it's not a dream that can come true, that dream can often become a nightmare. It can haunt us. The feeling that I wish I were not going to find myself in Egypt. I wish I weren't going to find myself on another path where I'm not sure where it's going to lead to try to find my way home. The desire to have what has always been normal. Maybe for us, we see comfort in the story of the infant Jesus more than in the baby Jesus. Maybe our Bethlehem is not that silent night, holy night we sing of, where the angels are singing and the shepherds are arriving. It may not even be that arrival of the three kings, but it may be the night where everybody gets out of Bethlehem and you have just the memories of what it was like that we affiliate with. Do you have those? Do you have that maybe that Christmas moment that you never can relive or that memory that seems to haunt the feeling of Christmas? If only if only this year the salary had been the same. If only this year we could have been able to be with. And then the Holy Writ is the story of people who find themselves suddenly completely displaced and being faithful to God in it. Notice that the reason these guys are leaving, whether it's Joseph or whether it's the three kings. I'm calling three kings. I know there's not, that's not right. For the sake of short, Aaron, you know what I'm saying. I don't anybody know him. Last week you said they weren't three kings. This week you say three kings. Right now I'm just mumbling, and I know that. <laughs> the Magi and Joseph, why did they leave? Because they're told to. They're told to be faithful. And in this life, no matter what comes, no matter what change comes, you know what God says to you? Be faithful. Maybe this time of Christmas, we look to God in the, in the moments, in the hopelessness, or the confusion of change, and know that he is still there saying, I'm with you. Remember, this is the story that starts with, and his name shall be Jesus, and they shall call him... Emmanuel, God with us. Remember that this story in Matthew ends in chapter 28 where Jesus says, And lo, I am with you always. Maybe that's the message of hope. Maybe that's the message of hope when you are confused and wondering what's going on. <laughs> but you know what? There's another group of people. There are those mothers in Bethlehem who have the silence of the night completely interrupted by this group. Now, this story is contained only in the Gospel of Matthew. The reality is it's estimated that there are 10 to 30 children under the age of 2 probably in Bethlehem at this time. Now, that's a tragic event. Unless you compare it to everything else that Herod did. 
And then you start to realize why no other historian picked up on this story. This is why in the history of World War II, you don't read an account of Hitler being pulled over for a speeding ticket. It doesn't kind of really have the same force of all the other atrocities and evils he did. But tragedy on the level of what Herod did does not compare to the tragedy that it brings into the lives of these women and these families in Bethlehem. And for some, Christmas is not easy, and it's a struggle to celebrate, especially in the wake of tragedy. For some of you, this is the time of year when you remember those who not only are not here, but who cannot be here. Whether it's by the natural tragedy of the fact that sin entered into the life stream of mankind, and as a result, the wages of sin is physical and eternal death without Jesus. Some of us are separated from loved ones because sin entered the world and death took them out of the world. Others have celebrated, have a struggle in celebration because it's not just the fact that sin can take us by its natural cause in death, but because the sinful acts or the sinful choices or the reality of just a combination of those two led them to being gone this Christmas. And it makes Christmas hard. It makes the celebration of that bit difficult. And the struggle is, while everyone else is singing, your heart is still breaking. Grief can come in a variety of different ways at Christmas. And the struggle is, oftentimes, it's very hard that when we are rejoicing to remember those who are mourning. Despite the fact that Paul commanded us in Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. This was driven home in the last couple of weeks. Are you familiar with, Rick, you're probably familiar with the name Rick Warren. Saddleback Church in California. His wife, Kay. And they lost their son, Matthew, last July. Uh, he took his own life. And Kay recently wrote about her dealing with Christmas cards. Said that last year, she just realized she couldn't do it. There were only so many family letters of all the great things going on she could stand. There were only so many pictures of a happy family in those god-awful, ugly sweaters standing <laughs> around that she could look at. And she said what made it harder was people were sending these cards without any thought given to their situation. And she said she thought maybe in the second year it would be better. Maybe in the second year things would get better. She said when she opened the first card this year, and it was written by some minister she didn't know, and it had no concept of anything personal about it, but it was just a generic card, she threw it down and decided she's not opening any cards. But she wrote this. And maybe this is something for us to consider. I ask readers to consider sending a plain card to grieving families instead of an obligatory happy family photo. Tell them in a few words that you're aware of how painful Christmas can be and that you're praying for them. Then I wrote, yeah, it's inconvenient. It'll take more time than your rush signature. And it will require entering into someone else's loss Someone else's mourning, someone else's grief, and someone else's anger. You know the temptation of coming up with this sermon series was I really wanted to figure a way to move this sermon out. This series came together on a phone call with a buddy of mine driving back from somewhere. When we talked about what we could do for Christmas, I said, you know, how many night stories are there? And we started talking it over, and I said, okay, we're going to go ahead and call it four nights, because we've got four weeks. We can sneak Matthew's account of the stories instead of five. Did anybody notice that, by the way? And then I said, now, here's the problem with what I just lined out. You realize we've got to do the story of the slaughter of the innocents the Sunday before Christmas. And that's when my buddy said, yeah, I'm out on that series. And I thought, you know, that may be wise counsel. 
But then I realized I've been preaching Christmas now for 15 years. And I don't know that any time I've been forced to pause and think of those who are dealing with loss, mourning, grief, and anger at this time of year. Because I've grown up where the idea of Christmas is that miracle. That you will not spend Christmas alone. Richie Cunningham will come and find you. That when you overbake the turkey and it explodes and you start to cry, dim-witted, your dim-witted husband Eddie will, uh, will not understand why you cry. Seriously, you've got to watch Christmas Vacation, people. That's, it's the Christmas movie of the century. <laughs> The idea that there's any sort of suffering, we kind of gloss it over. We want to wrap it with a bow and put shiny, sparkly things on and pretend. Maybe that's why we take a dead tree, put it in our house, and decorate it, and pretend that this is the sign of life. <clears throat> so if you're one of those people, let me apologize that at least in the last 15 years I've never spoken to you about the hope that comes in Christmas and the reality of the suffering and the struggles and the mourning and the loss. But let me also remind you that the story of Christmas is this, that God himself entered in to our mourning and our suffering and our anger and our grief and our loss. That when the world is chaotic, when there is no silence, when there seems to be no hope, when sin seems to have overcome, when it means that you have lost someone to the ills of disease that sin brought, when relationships have been destroyed, possibly beyond reconciliation, that there is hope for silence, and it's found in Jesus. There is hope, and it's found in Jesus. Matthew leads us to that without really just beating us over the head with it, by the way. There are two events that are referenced in this text. Back when Joseph and Mary leave for Egypt, the Exodus event is brought to our attention. Hosea 13.1 is what Matthew quotes when he says, And it was done so that the scripture could be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. And Hosea, that's a reference to the Exodus. That's a reference to that great delivering and redeeming moment when God brought his people out of the land of bondage and into the land of milk and flowing honey, the land that was called paradise, the land of Canaan, the promised land, the land of hope. And then we have the results of the mother's tears. The torment, the crying that comes in Bethlehem. And we quote Jeremiah with the fact that Rachel cannot be comforted because her children are gone. What the next two verses in Jeremiah are after the one that Matthew quotes? I think it's always important when you see an Old Testament quote, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, go find out what else is around it. Context makes a difference. Here's what comes next in Jeremiah chapter 31. As there's crying and there is no way of comforting her, this is what the Lord says, Jeremiah says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded. Oh, God notices your pain. God notices your suffering. And this is a context not just of any child being gone, this is the exile. This is the other big X event in the history of Israel. That when they got the promised land, they lost the promised land. And the men are, and the boys are wrinkled up and going to be taken <laughs> east, interestingly enough. And as they're leaving, Jeremiah writes of how 70 years later something's going to happen. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is what? Hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. 
I think there's a reason why Matthew tells us that there's a need for an exodus and that we're in a time still of exile. There's still need for redemption and there's still need for restoration. And guess who the restorer is? Out of Egypt, I call my son. While there is weeping and darkness, go to Luke's story, where when he can finally get his voice back, John the Baptist, Father Zechariah, breaks into the prophetic song. And speaking of the fact that John will be the forerunner, describes Jesus in this way in Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those who are living in darkness, and in the shadow of death, he will guide our feet into the peace. He will bring into the chaos and the noise silence. Want to wish for silence? Want to wish for peace in a time where you feel turmoil? Then our hope is Jesus. Jeremiah continued in chapter 31 to speak of why Jesus came. Why Jesus is the only hope that we can have. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. If you want to put an Old Testament verse to memory, this would be one to do. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. The ones where it leads to exile when they don't fulfill it. The one where it leads to a need of delivering all the time. The one that came out of the Exodus when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they what? Broke that old covenant. They, they basically were unfaithful to me, even though I was a faithful husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel at that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law into their minds. I'll write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will you become part of the nation, and then you have to ask somebody, what does it mean to be part of the kingdom of God? No, no longer will a man have to teach his neighbor or a man to his, his brother say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And on the night when she was betrayed, Jesus took the cup. And with the cup he said, This is the new cup. The hope in a world without silence. In a world where it may be the most glorious time of the year. But there still seems to be war. There still seems to be disease. There still seems to be separation. And there's still loss. The hope is that we trust in the God who will restore. That the enemy of sin and death will have no victory for Jesus has taken it away. As the worship team comes to lead us in our invitation this morning, if today you need to know more about the fact that, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your victory? Now that Jesus has entered into the story, and Jesus himself has taken on the suffering by the cross and overcome it by the power of the resurrection, so that you can be part of that new covenant. We offer you the opportunity to respond this morning. Would you stand for our invitation as we sing?